Hi, my name is Dustin Goot and I manage the Creator Solutions Group at TikTok. We work to connect brands and creators to produce interesting, joyful marketing content on the platform. At TikTok, we believe strongly in the value of these partnerships. We want to give creators the opportunity to work with great brands and to show brands the many benefits of working with our diverse creator community. I'm incredibly excited to be talking about these brand partnerships today and to be joined by truly three of the best in the business at making great brand content that is both authentic to TikTok and to their individual channels. These are masters of their craft whom we can all learn from. With that, uh, I wanna jump straight into introductions. I'm going to show a sample brand video from each of our esteemed panelists and then I'll give a direct introduction and then we'll get straight into the conversation. I'm going to be going alphabetically by TikTok handle for the introductions. So that means first up will be Alan Chicken Chow. Hey guys. Amazing. The um, that the ice cube sandwich uh, kills me every time in that video. I have to say. Um, so, uh, Alan Alan Chicken Chow is a comedy creator, actor, and writer. Alan rose to stardom through his quirky and relatable comedy skits on TikTok and has amassed over two million followers across platforms. Alan has gone on to work with brands such as Adobe and Reese's Puffs and has collaborated with Alicia Keys on the release of her new hit single, Underdog. As an actor, Alan has starred in film and TV projects such as ABC's Grey's Anatomy, Hulu's Into the Dark, and the CBS multicam pilot, The Emperor of Malibu, starring Ken Jeong. Through his work, Alan is passionate about celebrating what makes us different and bringing us together with what makes us all human. Welcome, Alan. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to talk to you all about brands. That was a really fun one because that ramen we actually ordered from DoorDash and we're like, oh, this is so dang. So I'm excited to speak to you guys. Awesome. Uh, so our next panelist will be Cosette. Welcome, Cosette. Uh, I love that. I love the use of the duet feature in that video. It's so, so TikTok uh, and so fun uh, for a brand video. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Hi, everyone. All right. Cosette is a leading content creator and tastemaker on TikTok. Since joining TikTok in early 2019, Cosette has amassed more than 2 million followers and is known for her fashion and lifestyle content. She is a trailblazer known for her impressive use of TikTok's video features such as Duet, as we just saw. Brands have taken notice and, established, and enlisted her for consulting services and partnerships. Cassette has worked with fashion brands Dolce & Gabbana, Levi's, Tory Burch, Boohoo, and attended Milan and New York Fashion Week with TikTok earlier this year. Yeah, that says it all. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here and talk to you guys and share any knowledge that I can offer. Great. Uh, well, we're we're going to get to that in just a hot second. But first, our last, uh, or first, our last. Uh, next up is uh, is Young Astro. Awesome. That was indeed an original Reese's Puffs rap, you guys. Uh, you, you saw it here. Um, young Astro, born Anthony Haynes, is an American entertainer, actor, director, and content creator, as well as storyteller. 
Young Astro's content is based around real life situations, whether it's family life or everyday episodes. He takes situations and crazy circumstances and turns them into cinematic and very dynamic commercials. Young Astro is an artist and a cinematic philanthropist, all while taking notes, paving the lane for others, constantly building a brand and leaving a trail of great business along the way. Welcome, hey, Young Astro. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me here. It's such an amazing opportunity to, to speak on a panel like this. Forever grateful for it. And yeah, I, I'm so happy to be here. I'm like really excited to be here. Incredible. Well, I'm, I'm so excited to be talking with all three of you. And let's get right into it. So I have just played three videos that I love of yours and talked a little bit about them. But I would love to hear from all three of you, what is your favorite brand video that you've worked on? And tell us a little bit about how the opportunity came about and why you are so proud of it. Let's start with, uh, let's, let's keep it alphabetical. Alan, why don't you start us off there? Yeah, for sure. So my favorite was actually, I did a Reese's Puffs brand new as well. That was my favorite because I grew up watching Saturday morning cartoons and that rap was always on TV. Like the Reese's Puffs, Reese's Puffs. So I was like, oh my gosh, I get to like participate in this thing that was like part of my childhood. That was super fun. It was a brand opportunity that was sent through my creative partner manager at TikTok because it was a branded hashtag and something that was on the explore page. It came through that team. And it was like a really fun opportunity. I did like some cool clo clothing transitions with mine. And yeah, it was, it was a really fun brand to work with. I think because that rap and that audio and the whole concept was really young and fun and identified a, a lot with the videos I already made. Nice. Hmm. Cosette, you wanna, we'll just, we'll stay alphabetically. You guys can give your favorites. Yeah, one of my favorite brand opportunities that I've done was actually Dolce & Gabbana, which you previously mentioned. That was one of the first times I was actually able to travel with a brand, which was such an insane thought for me to even think about, you know, considering that I started TikTok only a year and a half ago. But yeah, it was just like combining everything that I love. I have been obsessed with Dolce & Gabbana my entire life, but have never really been able to rock it because, you know, it's expensive. But uh, it, was, it was a trip to Milan for Milan Fashion Week. And one of my favorite parts was that there were a ton of creators on the trip. It was coordinated as well through TikTok because it was such a large scale. So many creators uh, were at the show shooting content. So it just made for a very collaborative experience. And plus I got Dolce & Gabbana out of it. So it was a dream. <laughs> Astro. Well, bouncing off of what Alan had mentioned, you know, the Reese's Puff ad was my favorite ad as well mainly because of how, you know, nostalgic it is. And it just, it hits home with me. You know, I, I grew up eating Reese's Puffs. I love the candy Reese's. I watched, you know, all the commercials. And it's like, who don't know who Reese's Puffs is. And to receive like opportunity like that is like one in a lifetime. And I got that opportunity through my creative agency, I8 Agency, and they presented it to me. And I was like, oh, this is this is this is huge. I'm not about to like play around with this. I'm about to, you know, go crazy on it. And that's what I did. And, you know, it just that was, that was my favorite one out of all the advertisements that I've done so far. It's definitely the Peace Plus video. Awesome. Well, yeah, it, it definitely came out amazing. Uh, and I want to move on to get to the question that's on everyone's minds who's uh, attending this session, which is, how do I get these deals? How can I get in on this amazing action? And I want to go back to you, Cosette, because you were talking to me about the Dolce & Gabbana opportunity um, and, uh, some, and how you felt like some of the things that you were doing with your channel, maybe leading up to that, helped, um, helped create that opportunity for you. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, one way that I love kind of manifesting in a way, but more literally brand deals that I really want to work with are by seeding the product. So for example, Dolce & Gabbana and just like any high fashion brand, I really wanted to break more into that type of industry for my content, especially around fashion week. It just aligned a lot more with what I was doing. So I started seeding these products into my video, incorporating if it was Dolce & Gabbana that I wanted to work with, I would incorporate more high fashion, high end brands into my content. So it seemed more organic and natural. And when they saw that it made more sense for their type of content. So seeding is definitely something that I do a lot with my content, 
even if it's not necessarily intentional, if I'm not, okay, I really want to work with this brand, so I'm going to put the products in. Just naturally by incorporating products that I love and brands that I love, it usually leads to some type of opportunity down the road. Amazing. I would love to throw throw the same question out to, to the other two. Uh, just how do you get noticed by brands? What are some things that, that creators can think about to increase these opportunities for themselves? Well, for me, I feel like, you know, my thing, my biggest thing is quality, you know, quality over quantity. So I always make sure that whatever I'm putting out looks the best. And I could take like, you know, just an everyday snack that I would eat like Gushers or something like that. I love Gushers. And one day I want to work with Gushers. So just like Cosette said, you know, seeding that product into my content, manifesting it down the road. I always have been doing that ever since I started making content. Um, I always try to make myself marketable as well. You know, I, like when I make content, I make it to where it's like, you can see this on like a TV screen or you can see this in like a, like an ad break of like a TV show or something like that. I always keep that in mind and I always make sure that it looks like top notch always. But that's like, that's one of my biggest tips is quality over everything. Yeah, I completely agree with what you said. I think one common trait that all three of us uh, have is that we don't just make like easy videos. We really show in our profiles the ability to execute on a concept. Because whenever a brand comes to you, they have a company mission, they have a mission behind their specific ad that they want the creator to be able to execute on. And so whenever you're representing the face of the brand, they want that to be aligned with their brand and a high quality video. So as much as you can make your profile into a resume of sorts where they're like, oh, wow, this person does make high quality videos. They're able to execute on concepts and ideas and also has you know family friendly content, nothing that would embroil them in any type of controversy. I think that looks really good to a brand. Always thinking about empathizing yourselves in their perspectives, what type of creator would they want to see as the face of their brand? Yep, that's that's big. You always have to make sure whatever you're putting out will be okay with you know younger people watching it or showing their parents or something like that. You know. Yep. That, yep. That, or a uh, or a marketing manager showing their boss, which is yes. uh, which is often how this uh, is is happening. Um, yeah, I think thinking of videos as your as your personal resume for these opportunities is an, is an awesome point. And uh, Cosette, it was a point that you were making again when we uh, had had our prep talk um, about the process of building up that resume when when you're just starting out. Maybe you haven't had a, a lot of these uh, brand deals to start. Can you talk a little bit about um, again people earlier in their career in their TikTok journey um, can think about building that resume? Yeah, that's huge. I mean, nowadays, instead of a business card, you have your TikTok, your Instagram, whatever it is. It literally is a portfolio and brands are looking at that. So, you know, when you first start on TikTok, you don't get brand deals immediately. It, it builds up over time and you have to build those relationships. So there's no shame in reaching out to the brand yourself, which is a lot of what I did both in the beginning and years ago when I had a fashion blog, I was emailing like a hundred brands a day trying to get some type of deal. So you're never going to have something to show for a brand deal unless you start out, you know, you have to start somewhere basically. So what I was doing was writing out a template in when I was 14 years old, running a fashion blog in my freshman year of high school, I would write out a single template and find a ton of shops that aligned with what my brand was on my blog. And, you know, just send out massive amount of emails every day and just ask in exchange for, merchandise because brands are not always going to want to put a budget towards you if you just start out and you don't really have anything to show for yet. So I think there's, um, there's a lot of value in taking those either, uh, you know, lower budget deals or even just doing deals with brands that you really like to just have content to build up with well, that's what something that I've done over time. And again, it builds those opportunities. So if you do a ton of smaller and brand deals with smaller companies, then when the gushers comes to you, you know, the gushers or the Dolce Gabbana, whatever it is, you have something to show for work that you've already done. Yep. And just like, just, I want to make, want to make like a quick comment about like working with like smaller brands that don't really have like a budget or anything like that. I feel like 
oftentimes some creators they that's what they're always looking for is like money or trying to get like something from a brand and that's also crucial as being in a creator it's not always about getting paid about something sometimes you just might need some exposure or you can build a relationship with a brand like if you work with a con if you work consecutively with one brand all these years you know they're putting you on their their website you're getting free merch all this you always helping them out then sometime someday down the line they're going to come with you they're going to come to you with like a big check because you know we already have that relationship so i just think you know it's not always about the money and coset made like a really good point with like you know just building up that roster yeah definitely i still keep in touch with brands that i worked with when i was 14 and i'm 21 now so I still keep in touch with those brands that I did free work for, and now they want to come to me with paid deals. It's really just like, if you're in the game for just making like as much money as you can on as many deals as you can, you're not going to really be able to build longevity out of that. It's more of, if you want a long sustaining career, you want to be able to build those strong relationships with brands to, you know, you never know where someone's going to end up. I did this free deal like six months ago, I want to say for this woman who was at this company and then the next month she moved to like this huge company and she was like, Hey, remember me, you did this favor for me. So now I want to give you this large brand deal. So just, you know, make friends with everyone and be authentic to yourself, work with the brands that you want to see yourself in, in the future. And brands that you actually like, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I, th I think the thinking about the, quality of these partnerships, the relevance of these partnerships is, is such an important point and moves us into kind of the next uh, topic area I'd, I'd love to talk about, which is, let's say that you are, are a little more established or you're, you know, you're starting to get some offers rolling in. How do you evaluate the offers? How do you determine what's right, what partnerships are right for you to accept um, versus ones you might want to take a pass on? Uh, Alan, maybe you could start us there. Yeah, piggybacking, piggybacking off of what Young Ashker said, it's it. The priority should be about brands that you like and you want to align yourself with, rather than the money. The money should be, you know, a result of the deal, but it shouldn't be your first intention. Um, recently, I did a brand deal with the, the King of Satin Island, which was a Pete Davidson movie. I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool, so exciting, and I would jump on an opportunity like that because I want to align myself with that because I also come from acting and filmmaking and that's the, that's the path that I want to expand myself into. I think that taking deals like that, align yourself with that kind of, um, those brands and that feel and, and that's what people gather from your profile rather than maybe promoting like a ton of smaller apps or like, 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 Likey my likey my panda app, you know, like taking like fifty of those to for all those small little monies. Or even if an app like that, which you don't really align yourself with, doesn't align with your audience, they do offer like a large sum of money. I think really just making sure that you are being very particular with who you want to align yourself with. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, I could not agree with that more. My dad says, "Work smarter, not harder." And it literally builds on the idea that it's better to wait for those larger opportunities that really, you know, you feel passionate about and align more with your brand than take every single deal as it comes. And when you're evaluating these brand deals that come through, it's so important to be picky and be very like skeptical about what brands you want to work with because it is your personal brand that you're protecting and any brand that you work with is going to then contribute to what your brand image is later down the road. One thing that I feel very personal about, for example, is skincare. I'm very, very, you know, particular and picky with skincare companies that I work with because I have a history of acne and I struggled with it a lot growing up. And I fell for all those like Instagram posts of random acne products growing up. And that's something that I feel very strongly about. So whenever a skincare company will reach out to me, I'll ask them to trial the product first for at least two weeks to see if it works well for my skin and make sure that I'm advertising something that I actually like and that works well for me because you know, I, it, it just builds on the whole, I want to be as authentic with my audience as possible. And I, I want them to, I want to share with them products that I love and I don't want to be faking anything. Yep. And I just feel like, you know, sometimes it's okay to say no, mm. you know, it's, it's, it's cool to be like, nah, I, that doesn't really align with the type of 
creator I am and I have a whole audience that's looking at me for a specific thing. If they see me promoting like a company that's all about like smoking cigarettes or like a whole bunch of violence and stuff, and, they, and I'm promoting that, they about to look at me like, oh, that's what you're into? I don't think I want to follow you anymore. I don't think I want to support you anymore. I, now I'm losing supporters because of that one deal that could have yeah. saved me from like thousands. And, you know, everything is like every deal you get because people going to like as 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 much as you grow, you're going to get a lot of brand deals. You're going to get a lot of advertisements. People just throwing stuff at you, throwing money at you. And if your audience is looking at you like you're just taking all types of deals, like what are you really in this for the passion of creating content or are you just trying to like come up? You know, that's why I don't take every every advertisement that comes my way, I say no, you know, especially if it doesn't align with the type of person that I am. So I think that's, you know, just like Cosette and Alan said, you know, they made very valid points. You know, just yeah. stay true to yourself. Always stay organic because people can definitely tell when you're faking something. You can't, it's just not going to fly. Very true. Yeah. Stay, stay true to yourself, I think is never, never bad advice in, in any arena. Uh, but I think it's such a, an important thing for people to hear you guys say, it's okay to say no. I think that can seem really scary, especially if you're earlier on and maybe you're not getting a lot of deals. It, it can feel like I don't want to offend people or alienate people. But in my experience, you actually get so much respect for saying no, because you're being true to yourself. And as Cosette mentioned, you never know where people are going to end up. You might tell someone, no, this brand is, you know, doesn't align with me, but then they end up at some other brand a year later. And they're like, actually, this brand I think is so much, you know, a better fit. And, and they're going to respect that you, um, you know, that you only accept things that are going to work for your audience. Uh, and I, I think that ends up benefiting you very much in the long run. Yes, it does. Your image is important. Yeah. So uh, I also want to hear, so there's auth the, the authenticity of your connection with the brand itself, but then there's also the authenticity of the content that you're creating for them. Uh, so I really want to hear how you guys go about planning that content once you've taken the deal. Uh, and and how you weave the brand in, in in an authentic way for you, uh, Astro. Maybe come come back and start with you. What's your uh, creation process like? Right, cool. So let's just say I get a brand deal or something, and they require me to come up with like a couple concepts revolving around what they're trying to get me to, you know, create. Now I'll pitch to my concepts. They may or may not like it. You know, let's just say they don't like it. For example, if they don't like it then they'll give me what they want me to do instead. And I'll look at that and be like, okay, well, let me see how I can still incorporate my creativity, like my own spin on what they want me to do so that it still appeals to my audience. Because if I'm just making something and it don't have, it, like if, if, my, if my viewers are watching an ad and they're like, this doesn't even feel like Astro, like Astro would not make something like this. They're not gonna watch it. But if I like, take what they want me to do and I put my spin on it, the viewer's not going to know if that was my idea or not because I have my sauce in it. Now, that doesn't happen all the time, but, you know, when I have when I have my own sauce, people know that that's a Young Astro video. <laughs> so, you know, no doubt. It, all, it, it just depends. Like, you, you don't also want to walk away from a deal like that because it could be something that you do like. They could be offering you a good amount of money. And just because y'all are not seeing eye to eye, on a concept doesn't mean that you have to like abandon the whole thing as a whole. Cause you could, one, you can mess up on missing out on money and you can mess up a relationship. So it's, that's when like the mindset of a creator has to kick in and be like, all right, let me just figure this out. Let me figure out how I can do this so that we're both happy on each side. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's what I do. Awesome. Would love to hear from from the other two, just your um, your creation process on these. Yeah, I'll pop in. So one, I saw this ad when I was going through, I don't even know what platform it was, but it was an ad for TikTok ads. And the copy read, don't make an ad, make a TikTok. And that stuck with me so much. I still think about it every single day because when you're posting an ad on TikTok, you don't want it to look overtly like an ad because 
most of the time when it does, all the comments are like, oh my God, this is an ad. Like POV, you're commenting on an ad. <laughs> like that's, that's what happens. And so you want to make it as organic as possible and make it fit as much with your page. Just as Astro said, you know, you want your audience to just think it's another video, but incorporate a product in it at the same time. And when you're working with a brand and you're brainstorming these ideas, again, as Astro said, you may pitch a concept and they're not crazy about it, but it's called a collaboration for a reason. When you're working with these brands, you want to brainstorm as much as possible and come to a conclusion of a concept that you're both happy about. And some brands have to be convinced a little bit more on making a more like TikTok authentic video because... You know, I've worked with a brand in the past that knows exactly what type of ad works on Instagram and they wanted to replicate that on TikTok, which doesn't necessarily work. You know, it's different on every platform, but it, it takes a conversation and it may take a little bit longer to decide upon something that's mutually agreed upon, but it'll be worth it in the end because you'll make the brand happy. You'll come to something that doesn't feel like a sellout on your page. And, you know, that, that just opens opportunities for more videos in the future. Yeah, I completely agree with that. It's super important for your video to feel like it's part of your profile because that also allows it to have the most virality for it to potentially pop off too. And that's what you guys both want, the brand and the creator want that video to, to be successful. Um, in terms of like literal process with working with brands, generally they'll send like a breakdown of what they want it to be with, again, like a mission statement, a breakdown of certain points they want to be hit. I usually study that really hard. I'm such a nerd from school and I'll really just circle and make sure that like if they say certain vocab words are important like irreverent or young and fun like to really incorporate that so you can decrease the amount of back and forth with the brand as possible. And then again like Cosette said Whenever you get a note, it's really important never to demonize the note or take it personally. You guys are both just human beings trying to create the best product possible. And so just putting your brains together to create something that you guys are both happy with is the best case scenario and making their jobs as easy as possible because you want them to come back to you with another brand deal. So like the best feeling that you want to give them was like, oh my gosh, Cosette was so easy to work with. We got to a video so easily and it did really well, you know? So as much prep work as you can do to make that process easy for the both of you guys is, the, is I think the best way to go about it. Yeah, not taking notes personally is so huge because nobody wants reshoots. Ideally, like in the perfect world, you come across or you come upon the perfect video right away, but you guys both want the same goal. And so, you know, they're going to have notes, you may have notes and that's just what the process is. So it's so important to just not take that at heart and yeah. work hard, come up, come to the best video possible and everyone will be happy. Yeah. It's like the concept of improv, like in improv, you're never supposed to negate any ideas that people throw out. It's always yes. And, and so I think the same thing works with any collaboration with a brand or even just with biz people in general always building upon ideas rather than like being like, no, not for me. <laughs> <laughs> and Cosette, you told me about kind of a unique solve you had on one of your deals, which probably won't necessarily work in every situation, but I think it's interesting to, for people to hear the type of problem solving you can go through with brands. Uh, do you want to talk about the, how you kind of handled a, an impasse you had on um, uh, like a brand pushing a concept that um, you were you were a little skeptical of? Yeah, definitely. So earlier on in my TikTok career, probably a couple months in, TikTok was still very new. It still is very new for brands to advertise on. But I had a hair company come to me and they really loved my videos and they wanted to make something together to promote a specific hairline. And they gave me their concept of what they wanted. And upon looking on it, of course, you have to take into account what the brand wants because you want them to be happy. But I noticed that it was very traditional like professionally shot they wanted it against a white backdrop with you know full lighting setup and just something that didn't really seem to TikTok like for me and so i came back to them and i pitched an alternate concept of something that is more TikTok like so the first video they just wanted me to do my hair against a white backdrop with sound playing in the background and i pitched you know what if i just did a selfie video like in the mirror in my bathroom and did random like hair color all over and saw what the results were. And they were like, eh, I don't know. I don't blame them for being skeptical so early on in TikTok, but 
some brands are just really stuck to, you know, what they're used to and what they know works. So I, it was actually luckily a two video deal that I had set up with them. So I said as a compromise, okay, how about I try the first video is the professionally shot one that you want. And then for the second video, I can try my own spin if you're okay with it. And if it doesn't perform well, I will do, you know, your professionally shot. That's completely fine. But could you just give me a chance and like, let me, I, I just wanted to prove to them that this type of content does work better on TikTok. For that situation, since it was early on and they were kind of taking a chance with trusting my idea because TikTok was so new, I did give them the option of if this doesn't perform well, I'll still redo another one, which was a unique situation. But I posted the professionally shot one. It performed okay, like nothing outstanding. And then I posted the like, you know, rugged selfie video of me being like, oh my God, my hair, like what's going on? And that video like blew up. I think it got like half a million views in 24 hours. And they were like, oh, okay, we understand now. Like, yes, can we go with that style? We love it. And then moving forward in their future deals, I noticed that they went a lot more with that TikTok style. So sometimes it takes brands a little bit more convincing, but uh, again, you just have to trust your gut. And a lot of the brands, like, yes, they may be professionals at different media outlets or, you know, Instagram or TV commercials, but they know that you're the TikTok expert per se, and you're the one who knows your platform and audience better than anyone else. So it, it just takes convincing, but again, it's a collaboration and conversation between the creator and the brand. Yep. Um, I, I love that story. Just again, I don't think that's something everyone's going to do, but just kind of the unique problem solving approach that you took. Um, and also Alan, you talking about nerding out over the brief and, and circling things um, to me just speaks to the professionalism that you put into it. Um, and Astra, I'd, I'd love to come to you because you mentioned professionalism is so important for you in these partnerships. Um, talk a little bit about what what being professional means to you. How do you demonstrate that? Okay, well, being professional when dealing with the brand is, you know, you have to, you have to know what you're talking about. You can't just be, you know, you, they're not like one of your friends. You can't speak to them like a friend. You have to talk to them like very business minded and you know piggybacking off of what like Cosette said about you know trusting your gut even like when when a brand is not really feeling what you're trying to do you have to remain calm and still try to get your vision out there because at the end of the day it's your page it's your audience it's you in the video it's not them you know and you know sometimes a lot of people have to see things to believe it instead of just, you know, listening to what you have to say. So it's all about just remaining calm and trusting yourself and just not. And when, when someone tells you, no, you don't just like fly off the handle and be like, well, this is my page and this is what works for me. You see, I have all these numbers, like all that type of stuff, because they're going to look at you like, OK, well, he's a hothead. I don't even know why we came to him in the first place. Let's never do business with him again you know, and stuff like that. So I just, I just stay calm and I just know what I'm talking about. And I always try to get my vision across no matter what the circumstances, because this is my page, this is my platform. I know it works for me. Yeah. You yeah. Know. If I could hop in what you just said, I love what you said about don't fly off the handle because I think with TikTok and, you know, it's so easy to build an audience. People have the tendency to think they're all that, you know, they know what's best. The brand should listen to me. But at the end of the day, the brand is hiring you and they are paying you. So you have to provide your services. It's so yep. important to remember you are not above the law. You're not above everything because, oh, I have this many followers. The brand is hiring you. And at the end of the day, you need to make them happy. So as much as you have to come across a conclusion, you know, you have to please the brand at the end of the day. That's the most important thing. Yep. Cause they the ones with the money, they paying you. <laughs> I'm saying they, they got the money. So it's like they could, they have a say so in whatever is going on in the, the campaign whether you like it or not just don't you could be upset just don't show them that you upset <laughs> like, all right, we'll uh ne never never let them see you sweat uh, yeah i love the be perspective behind the screen but don't be don't don't show them that because then they're just not about to work with you no more yep i'd like to dip in for a quick second to an audience question that came over from uh instagram stories um are there any red flags that you look out for when you receive brand deals things that in an offer or a brief that uh would 
uh, you know, signal that uh, either you shouldn't do the deal or maybe there's just things that you need to have a deeper conversation about? Well, one of the main things I look for in a business email is the approach, like how they sound when they're trying to get a business inquiry out of me. If they're, if the email is like all clumped up in one section and it's not broken up into like what they want to do and they don't have no like no website name at the end of it then i know all right they're not legit and there's no point of me like about to waste my time looking through all that and i also just i pay attention to how people sound in their emails like how like the the wordplay of what they say what they need for me um and i do my research on the brand as well i, I see what they're about so and if it doesn't align, like that goes back to what we said before, if the brand doesn't align with me or what I'm doing, what I'm putting out, if I don't feel like if I can make something will it appeal to my audience, then I'm not going to dibble and dabble with it. Yeah. One of the biggest things that I always keep my eye out for, which I think a lot of smaller creators overlook is licensing and what they're asking the rights for, because you could sign off on a deal without like, you know, a smaller budget deal without even realizing you're signing away the rights for them to use that video for a year, five years, 10 years, however long it is. And a lot of times smaller brands, I mean, the larger brands will usually, that will be part of the negotiation. But sometimes I've noticed brands try to get away with just throwing that in the contract and then you don't even realize it. And as long as they're able to use that video, your face is associated with that brand. So if, you know, let's say CoverGirl is using my video for five years, then any other company like Revlon or any other company is going to look at that and think, oh, well, now she's associated with our competitor. So licensing is one of the most important things that is so often overlooked. And as, again, for smaller creators, it can be very difficult to understand, but that's definitely something to keep an eye out for. Mm, that's, that's a big I, one. I think that's a great, that's a great watch out and uh, important negotiating point. Uh, it also brings up the question of pricing, which I know tons of people have questions about. And uh, I'll say no one expects you guys to talk about your own rates uh, on this session, but um, just thinking about how to price yourself as a creator, is there any good general advice that you guys can give on that part of the negotiation? I can give a lot of good advice on that. Basically. <laughs> Like at the end of the day, man, you you gotta know what you're worth. Like you gotta look at the type of work that you put out. You you gotta know what you can bring to the table, and you should never ever settle for less. It don't matter who's coming at you. It don't matter what what kind of company name it is. It doesn't matter. They see what you can do, and they're gonna. The first thing a brand, in my eyes, the first thing a brand is going to do is they're going to offer you the lowest amount of money possible. Now, it's up to you, the creator, to realize that and be like, oh, no, I'm, I'm worth way more than that. Let me raise the price up some. They got money. Like, these brands have a lot of money to spend on whatever campaign that they're trying to do. But it's your responsibility as the creator to recognize that and get what you're worth. That's yeah, and don't be don't be afraid to sp to speak to like your peers and fellow creators around the same size as you. You know, people that you trust obviously. Don't be afraid to talk to them about how much they're getting paid just so that you have some type of basis. I know a lot of the creators that I'm really close with, we have a very transparent relationship, especially if we did the same deal. We mm -hmm. want to just know so for the future we have, you know, something to compare to and to base off. Just again going back to knowing your worth. Yep. Yeah, and also coming from it with the perspective of each brand is its own beast. Like they all have their own budget and each one has its own like negotiating power. Really what you get paid is not necessarily how much the service is worth always, but it's how much you can negotiate, right? That's the that's the idea behind sales in general. And so just I think it's very important like they both said to value yourself at the highest that you value yourself. Always come at, come with your own worth high. Generally, mm -hmm. they will probably come back with something less. Maybe they'll match you, which is great. That's the best case scenario. But if they do come back with a lesser budget, then you decide with yourself. Again, this goes back to, is this a brand that I wanna align myself with? Is it worth it for me to align myself with this brand for potential future deals or just for the uh, aligning of 
uh, you know, types of deals that I do on my page? And is that worth, you know, taking a dip for this deal? And I think those are also important things to think about as well. And one last thing. Um, and when you, when you are negotiating with these brands and you're trying to get like a, a higher price, many brands not going like that. They're not going to go with that. There's going to be a lot of people who will say no, but there are people who are going to say yes. And the people who do say yes, the deal will be worth it. There's nothing wrong with saying, like you've been saying, like these points keep coming back up in discussion. There's nothing wrong with saying, no, I'm worth, well, you don't have to say I'm worth this, but you can negotiate the price and, you know, you just go from there. But don't be afraid to, you know, take a rejection because there's always that one person who will be like, all right, we could, we could do that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I'm getting the, um, uh, the sign off notice from our producers here. We're coming to the, the end of the session, uh, as, as a closer, uh, just super quick one. Um, would love to hear from each of you. One thing that the creators listening on this could do in the next month to, create more opportunities uh, for themselves with brands. Um, and I'll, I'll let you guys each each sign off. Um, uh, so I'll just say in advance of that, um, uh, the conversation will continue on the VidCon Discord server. Uh, so you guys can all um, swap over to that once the session wraps. Um, and it's uh, it's been such a pleasure talking to all of you before you give your closing thoughts. Um, and I think, honestly, the advice here has been amazing. Um, I hope everyone listening has been soaking it up. So um, closing tip from each of you. Alphabetical order, are we doing? <laughs> sure, yeah, let's, let's sure. go back. Uh, thanks for listening, guys. Again, I'm Alan Chicken Chow. So happy to have been able to talk with you guys on the panel and share our knowledge and information. My last tip would be to, in the next month, try elevating, try one video. Elevate your production level to something that is higher than what you have done before. Something that requires a, a bit more time, maybe a bit, a small investment to increase the, um, the production level of your page and see how that works for you. See how you feel doing that um, with the intention of showing brands, look, I can execute on this, not just a TikTok, a short 15 second short film. Think of it like that. Try to elevate your production level for, for a video. Try that out. Awesome. Yeah, I would say watch what your favorite brands are doing on social media. Follow them, watch their TikToks, research and make sure that you are aware of all of it and start building those relationships now. So when quarantine is over, you'll have a ton of brands lined up. But yeah, this was so much fun. Thank you guys so much for listening. You can follow me at Cosette on all platforms. And yeah, look forward to continuing the discussion. Okay, well, the last tip that I got, and just be aware of what you're putting out. Just make sure that it's marketable. Make sure that when people come to your page, make sure they can, you know, put that somewhere for everybody to see, not just you or just for that moment. And make sure that it's top quality because I'm telling y'all, quality is everything. Quality over quantity. Don't be afraid to say no. And I just want to thank y'all again for, you know, giving me this opportunity to come on this platform and speak and, you know, drop some gems because I know it's a lot of people listening, a lot of creators, you know, needing a path to follow. But yeah, that, that was my tip. Thank you, everyone.